Jesus is a, a servant of Christ, and it says he's one of them in verse 12, Colossians 4. It says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently, fervently for you in prayers, and you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. So remember, like uh, Laodicea is really close to Colossians here. And actually in the book of Colossians, it tells you, hey, give your letter to the, uh, to the Laodicean church and get the letter that they have and read it. And some people actually speculate and say that uh, there's a missing letter of Laodicea or something like that. But there's not a missing letter of Laodicea. What happened was Laodicea probably had the, you know, the epistle to the Ephesians or one of the Corinthian letters or something. Uh, these letters were circulated all around the churches. What they would do is the Colossian church would get the Colossian epistle from Paul. They would understand this to be, you know, hey, this is, this is from God through, through Paul. And they would copy down that letter and they would send the copy to the next church, you see. And they'd probably keep the original. That's what I would do. That's most likely what they did. And so they would send a copy of the epistle to another church. And that's how it got circulated around. And when you look at early uh, manuscripts, by the way, of the New Testament, this is why when you talk about Bible versions and stuff, I have a lot of people that don't want to move away from their new versions to the King James. What you got to understand is all the manuscripts found in the areas of these churches, you know, Asia Minor, as they call it, all these early church plants where all the epistles were actually sent. You know, you send one to Ephesus, you send one to Colossae, you send one, you know, here and there. All these churches, they receive the actual letters, right? Those are the ones that agree with the King James when you find those. But guess what don't agree with the King James? Uh, Egypt. Well, turn to the New Testament book of Egyptians. Turn to the book of, you know, it, it ain't there. You understand? Alexandria. It ain't there. The Egyptians didn't receive letters. The letters were received by the churches in Asia Minor, which is where you find manuscripts that agree with King James. What happened was that the churches over, you know, in Egypt, they, they made their own thing. They were widely known to have their own little libraries with a bunch of little nerds over there that would change the Bible and stuff. And so <clears throat> these letters were sent to Colossae, sent to Ephesus, sent to Corinth, sent to Galatia, and they were all in uh, a general area, and they were not in Egypt. And no, no letter was ever sent to Egypt, and that's why they agree with the King James. Now, Epaphras, it says, is one of these guys. So he's a Colossian. He's a teacher. <clears throat> it says that he has a great zeal for them. But it also seems like he maybe is traveling around to Laodicea and back and forth and here and there. Maybe he's a missionary of some kind. Maybe he's just a preacher who goes from church to church preaching. Anyways, there's a, there's a chance, uh, a good chance, I would say, almost a solid fact that he was a Colossian uh, it, it's also possible though that he was just saying that Epaphras was a servant of Christ like one of you and so there's a couple different ways you could take that <clears throat> in Philemon uh, 123 it says there salute the uh, Epaphras my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus so later on if you're reading Philemon you actually see that Epaphras gets locked up in jail alongside Paul and so uh, if it's kind of interesting to think about as you just look through who this Epaphras guy is. You can do the same thing with other people like Demas. Demas one time is with Paul ministering. And then later on, Paul says, Demas has forsaken me. So this Demas guy, I mean, it's a sermon all by itself, but this Demon, Demas guy was ministering with Paul, being a good Christian, teaching. And then you know what? Demas just one day decided, I'm tired of it. I'm done. And went back to the world. That's an option we all have. We can all do that. We can all just quit going to church. Would you be any less of a Christian? No, you wouldn't. You'd be, you might be a bad Christian, but you would still be a Christian. You could just quit going to church. Church doesn't make you a Christian no more. Like uh, I think that was, uh, what was that guy's name? Fell into Roman Catholic. Uh, Catholic uh, Billy Graham used to say, being in, uh, being in church don't make you a Christian no more than uh, being, a, uh, being in a garage makes you a car. And that's true. You know, you don't have to go to church to be saved. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. But to be a good Christian, you should. To be a good Christian, you need to read your Bible. And that, that's really the difference. And I'll tell you this. Demas might have still been a Christian, but he, you know, he gave up on Paul. But this Epaphras guy was in jail right alongside Paul. So that just gives you, in case you ever wondered, you know, I don't have a whole lot more to say on that. But as you read through there, you just get these names sometimes. Who is Epaphras? And you can actually track these through the Bible 
and learn a little bit more about them. You know, Epaphras, he was traveling back and forth from this church to Paul, and uh, he declared unto them their love in the spirit, it says. And so he was reporting on their works and their good deeds in, in Christ to Paul. He reported on their love for one another. Uh, he reported how they lo- had a love for the lost. You know, he was just kind of giving an update. It would be kind of like if, uh, you know, Jack permanently went to Florida or something, and he's like, Charles, I want you to keep the, that church open up there, and I'm going to have a church down here. I had to think about it first off, but it's to say I did it. Well, every once in a while, we'd at least want Jack to come give us an update or something, right? I mean, it'd be like having Jack in, and he's like, hey, guys, I, you know, down here, you know, I got so-and-so and so-and-so, and they said to say hi. That's kind of like what this is going on in these letters. And, it, you know, it's always a good thing to see people respond to what you say and to, to what you preach. And uh, over the years, you know, I've had a lot of different avenues for preaching, and I've had a lot of different reactions. And here, basically, what's saying is through Epaphras' preaching, through Paul's preaching, there has been, uh, you know, action there has been reaction and that's what compelling preaching and teaching does anything that is biblically based leads to some sort of action or response and the, the works that happen in response to paul's preaching leads paul to prayer it says when paul hears of their salvation and the fruit of the gospel in their lives he immediately begins to pray for them now his prayer for them isn't like hey give them a bunch of money his prayer for them isn't like even necessarily keep them healthy. It says he prays for them and desires that they are filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So his prayer for them, and you can can go over that and and see that in verse 9, his prayer for them was not a carnal prayer. Uh, So when he hears that these people are saved and he hears that they're doing good things for Jesus, he basically prays for them to be strengthened in those things to do more good deeds for Jesus and to be closer to Jesus and to be more loving and to be more understanding. And that's one thing that the modern church and modern Christians have quit doing is trying to learn the Bible more or trying to understand things more, but that's not biblical. Uh, You know, Christianity astray today, uh, they they think that uh, church is about music or it's about uh, emotionalism and stuff, and it's just not. That's why he prays for them to be filled with the knowledge of his will. Church should be about edification. And that's really the the heart of a preacher is to edify. And I I thought about this when I was doing this. I was thinking about back about like my my little journey here as a a preacher and teacher. I'm sure it's similar to a lot of other people's. Uh, You know, I I, I get saved and, you know, a year or two goes by, however however long. And then I kind of, I I come, I'm back and forth with things. I start learning the Bible you know, I, I commit myself really strong to church. I think a lot of times people do that when they're in their late 20s. Um, I don't think that's just a spiritual thing that happened with me. I think it is spiritual. But I think a lot of times when people are in their uh, younger 20s, they're not very mature. Uh, and when you're in your older 20s, close to 30, you start maturing a little bit. You get more serious about life. And I think at that point, in conjunction with, you know, God's drawing and re- rebuking my life, that's when I kind of bared down and started learning the Bible more, started trying to get people saved and witnessing to everybody. And the question I had all the time was, you know, what am I called to do? What am I doing here? And you might have asked yourself that question, and everybody does as a Christian, what's my spiritual gift and what would God want me to do? And everybody has to answer that for themselves. And the, the way that you learn that is through studying the Bible. In, in uh, Philippians, I think, chapter 2 is when I, when I understood what I was doing. It said that God works in you, as you work out your salvation with fear and trembling, God works in you both to will and to do. He'll give you the desires and the ability to do what he wants you to do. And so you don't really have to be concerned about what do I have to do for God, how does he want me to witness to family, or how does he want me to be nice to people and love on people and give to people, you know, how would God want me to do this or that. Instead, you focus on just loving the Lord, reading the Bible, and he just naturally will use you as he sees fit. It might not be a daily, everyday thing. It might not be a weekly thing. It might be once a month. But he will use you as a Christian to help other people in the way that he wants. And I asked that question, and I, I, I was an evangelist of sorts for a long time. I evangelized our area here. That's why I know it's dead in a doornail, by the way. Um, I witnessed really to most of the parts of Big Stone Gap. There's a few parts I've not knocked on the door. But really, 
at least over half of Big Stone. I've knocked on the doors. I've stood outside at restaurants, Hardee's. Uh, I stood outside of Walmart witnessing the people. Um, I eventually made like a YouTube channel and I got like millions of uh, or hundreds of thousands of hours of people watching my, my sermons and videos on, on YouTube. And I've, I even taught kids down there at West End. I, I, I taught kids for a couple of years in, in uh, children's church and I, I taught Sunday school there some and I, uh, I preached there some and I preached in Kentucky and I preached here and uh, you know I've just done different things everywhere I, I preached uh, on the streets in Kansas City I preached on the streets in New Orleans uh, you know I've been a lot of places and done a lot of different things but when I thought about these verses the reason I said all that is Somebody might say, well, why are you doing all that? Are you an evangelist? Or why are you doing all that? Are you a preacher? You know, at the end of the day, my heart is just the same as Paul's. Is it? I want to fill people with knowledge of his will, wisdom, and spiritual understanding. It's really all it is. I want to show people what I've learned in the Bible. I want to show people how serious Christianity is and how much they need to know their God. And this is the uh, heart that Paul had. Uh, he, he wanted you know, to the lost and the saved, he wanted to fill them with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And the Bible says that natural man does not understand the things of God. And so you can't help an unsaved man learn all this doctrine. I remember in Kansas City one time, some woman I was trying to witness to tried to start arguing me about the gift of tongues. And I just ignored it. And I learned that lesson over the years. You know, you don't, when you're talking to somebody who's unsaved, you don't just start talking to them about Bible doctrine. You, do, you have to witness to them. You have to get them saved. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You can't go up to a lost man and start arguing Bible doctrine. You, you can't do it. We was talking about preterism the other day. You know, it, most of these full preterists aren't even saved. They, they have these weird views that all of Revelation already happened and this and that. I mean, with some of these people like that, it's like talking to a one that's Pentecostal. You'd be better off just taking a step back and talking about how salvation is by grace through faith. Because I go ahead and tell you, 999 times out of 1,000, somebody who has some bizarre heresy of a doctrine that they believe probably don't understand the simple truth and simple milk of the gospel that you're saved just by believing on Christ. You don't work for it. You don't attain it by doing some good deed. Um... Because when a person's saved, they are actually, that now they can be sanctified. Now they can learn the word. Now things are spiritually discerned. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, if you don't have uh, the new man, you can't be spiritually discerning anything. You can't sanctify a lost man. That's what a lot of problems in a lot of churches over the years that I've seen is when people try to sanctify lost people. When, when you try to have lost people do the will of God. And that's the problem with churches that don't church discipline or let people run rampant. Like we've had people here wanting to take over the service. We had a, I was talking about this with Dad the other day. Had a woman here wanting to interrupt the service. And if you let those things go on, just imagine what your church would look like. You say you'd have more people in the pew, but you'd have people interrupting. You'd have people taking over the service. It would be uh, disorderly. It wouldn't be godly. It wouldn't be right. But a lot of churches, they try to make programs and do ministries and they, they don't ever rebuke sin. They don't ever t uh, preach any hard truths or anything like that. And they accumulate lost people. And then the lost people live like lost people. And the church gets a reputation of having a lot of wicked people in it. And it's just a snowball effect. But you can't expect these lost people in the pew that never hear about their sin, they never get saved, to actually live a godly life. And on top of that, one thing that's, that's astounded me is how ignorant people are of doctrine in churches. Most people don't know a whole lot of things about the Bible and, and you know the Trinity for example which is a baby truth I mean it's a an introductory level thing Michael should know what the Trinity is Michael should know that God is triune that he's the Father Son and the Holy Spirit Michael should understand that there is one God but that one God is three persons a kid should understand that a child in Christianity should understand that but how many people in the pews if you was to survey America would fail a quiz on the Trinity most of them because they did it uh, we, I looked, I told you about that Barna guy who went on Janet Mefford's show a, a couple months ago. And Christians across the country believed in work salvation. Why are people in the pews so incredibly ignorant toward Bible doctrine, just ignorant of Bible doctrine? The number one reason is they're not even saved. They don't understand because they got muddied up bad preaching. 
a guy named Justin Peters, uh, you know, he did a ministry and had a lot of good material uh, showing how phony these charismatic uh, Pentecostal type people were with their fake visions and their fake speaking in tongues and demonic uh, gestures and drunk in the spirit and all the kind of kooky stuff they come up with. But then he came out and said around 2012, 13, he got saved. He ministered for years in Christian churches. And he's like, I got saved now. I'm saved now all of a sudden. And it's like, what in the world? Why? How are you saved now? And he said, well, I finally figured out how repentance and faith aren't contradictory because he had a view of repent that meant quit works or quit sins, do works. That's not what repent means. Repent means to change your mind. That's not a work. If, I, if you say, hey, quit trusting in Muhammad and trust in Jesus, that's not a work. If, you, if I said, hey, change your mind about sin and can, instead of loving that sin, confess it to God. That's not working. You didn't have to actively quit the sin. I told you to change your mind about it. You see, it change your mind. I don't love it. I hate it. God, please forgive me of it. That's, that's a mind change. Repentance is not talk, It's not connecting like people do. People connect it to this uh, outward physical manifestation. Now, it does work itself out that way eventually, right? A changed mind will lead to change actions. But it's, it's, it's like the tree and the fruit. The fruit of the tree is going to be repentance. But the tree is actually, you know, what the word repent means. You change your mind, and the fruit of that changed mind is going to be changed works. Um, but So the people are mixing up categories, and really, it, I understand it can get confusing at different points and understanding that repent means change mind, and the Bible says repent all over the place. God repented more than anybody in the Old Testament. More than anybody in the Bible, God repents. And so he said, oh, I just understand now all of a sudden repent means, uh, yeah, it is works, but God gives us the works. That's how it jives with faith because God gives us faith because he's a Calvinist. You're not saved by works. What he was basically teaching now, I don't think Justin Peters is still saved. And I got, I got a lot of people saying, oh, he's still saved and all this kind of stuff. If you think you're saved by works and faith, you're called a Catholic. That's what Catholics believe. That's not what Christians believe. And yet tons of Christians that come out of like John MacArthur's church and these other kind of churches, these Calvinist movements, this is what they believe. If, if you got down, if you sat down and started talking to them and you asked them, if somebody just believes in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he died for their sins, was buried, and rose again, and they put their full faith and trust in his propitiatory sacrifice on the cross, he, he suffered the wrath of God in our place, he paid the full punishment for our sins, and all I got to do is trust in him, would I be saved? A lot of them would say, no, you need to, you need to turn from your sin too. You need to fully commit your life to Jesus like he needs your life or something. Um, and some of the Christian songs, you might hear this in some, in some hymns. And they're good hymns and they're good messages, but you've got to be careful of what you mean by it. Like all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. That's a good heart. That's a right heart. That's what you should do. But do you think that you're saved by just, here's my life, God? You, that ain't how you're saved. You're not saved by, all right, I quit all my sins. No one's quit all their sins. If you're saved by quitting sins, you're not saved because you ain't quit your sins. You have sins every day. You have mental sins. You have heart sins. You have outward physical sins. Everybody sins every day, and you never quit them all. And so these people in these churches, while they ain't being sanctified, while they're not being filled with the knowledge of truth, they're not even saved. They have a wrong view of salvation, like Justin Peters in his whole ministry, uh, Todd Friel, John MacArthur, I'll line them all up, Paul Washer. They all blur and muddy the lines. You say, well, you don't, I don't think they're not saved. I think at the end of the day, these people, they do believe in salvation by faith, but their doctrine, is, to, is they're trying to be contradictory on purpose. So they're telling people to repent, uh, to turn from their sins. They're telling people to give their life to Jesus, to, to you know, bow the knee to be saved. and all. You've got to give up everything. Steve Lawson is one of these guys. you got to be willing to give up your car. you got to be willing to give up your house. you got to be willing to pay it all. I mean, that's not how you're saved. That's how you're a disciple. That is how you commit to be a good disciple, to be somebody who's doing ministry for Jesus. That's not how you get saved. And they blur that line to teaching heresy and false doctrine and a false gospel. And the gospel is salvation by grace through faith alone in Jesus who paid it all. And I think a lot of churches have a lot of people who are not growing in the knowledge of the truth because a natural man understandeth not the things of God. You can't do it. And maybe this explains to you why, you know, you ever try to explain something maybe simple to you in the Bible or somebody in your family, you know, you're like, I just don't understand why they don't get this. Well, here's why they don't get it. The natural man understands not the things of God. 
You can't teach Bible doctrine to somebody who's unsaved. You can teach them the gospel because anybody can understand the gospel. For God so loved the world, right? It's easy. He gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's easy to understand the gospel. It's hard to understand a lot of theology. That's why it takes hours and hours of sermons to get through some stuff. So, you know, what drives a preacher to preach to the lost? Well, what the same thing that drove Paul. Number one, he wanted to preach to Christians and to, to give them understanding. He wanted to preach to lost people to give them understanding. But also, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, 11 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. Now, the judgment seat of Christ, note that, it is a judgment of works. And a lot of people, you're confused. You say, I thought we were saved just by faith. You've been making a point to that. Yes. But when you stand before Christ at the Bema Seat Judgment, as they call it, as you, the Judgment Seat of Christ, as it's called, when you stand before Him as a Christian after the rapture, you're going to be judged based off what you did for Him, what you did in uh, your life, what ministry you did, who you got saved, right? That kind of thing. And it also says whether good or bad. The Bible says all your waste, all your deeds that you did that were not good, uh, that were instead called bad. I don't necessarily think this means sins. You're not paying for your sins in front of Christ, okay? What he's talking about is the wood, hay, and stubble, I believe, where you did worthless things, right? All those Saturdays we just sat at home, did nothing, right? Watched college football. All those times you sit there and just waste your time. You're not going to get rewarded with a crown of gold in heaven for the time you wasted. You're, not going to also, you're also not going to be chastised for it necessarily either. You're just not going to be rewarded for it. And so it says, Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we're made manifest in the God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. And so it's really, if you look back there, it's the terror of the Lord that uh, Paul said persuaded him or led him to persuade men. Um, go to Ephesians 4. You can turn there and look at these verses here with me. Ephesians 4. I have a lot of these verses already written down, but I'll, I'll let you look at this one. A lot of times people, you might hear somebody say something, but unless you look at it with your own eyes, it doesn't really hit home in the same way. What is the purpose of preachers? What, what is, what is, when God has a preacher or a prophet or an evangelist, what is their purpose? Why are they there? Why do they do what they do? To comfort you, to heal you. What is the purpose? Is it a Joe Osteen thing where he just makes you feel good and smiley or something? What is a preacher's purpose? Look here in Ephesians 4. I'll actually turn there too instead of reading my, uh, my copy here. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, look at verse 11. The Bible says, He gave some apostles. We talked about that. When apostles were really the foundation of the church. And that's, that, that speaks to the 12, you know, Peter, James, John, and, and lastly, Paul, those kind. That's the apostle. Some prophets, the prophet, you could go through and say, who's a prophet? Well, I mean, in a sense, you, you could easily go through, just open up any Old Testament book of the Bible, Habakkuk, you know, stuff like that, uh, Isaiah, Ezekiel, even Daniel. Those are prophets, right? Some evangelists. We had Philip the evangelist in the book of Acts. You want to know who the evangelist might be. And then you got some pastors and teachers. And it does separate them. They are the same and they're also separated. To be a pastor is to be a teacher. Uh, but you can also be a teacher without being a pastor. And I think that's why it separates it. That's why, uh, you know, I could go to, we could just not have this church anymore. And we could uh, find another church and I'd go there. And I could teach Sunday school without being a pastor there. You know, that's a teacher. You could teach the Bible at home. We could have a church in my living room, and I could teach you in my living room. It, you could teach the Bible anywhere. And so some people are called to teach. Some people are called to be more pastoral and leaders. Um, now, what, are the, what is the purpose of these people? It says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The edifying, it speaks to the strengthening. So when you go back and you're looking in Colossians, you say, well, why would Paul say that, you know, he, why is he praying that these people are filled with knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding? Why does he just want people to know more? 
it's not just like gaining knowledge. Instead, it's it, the more you know about God, the more you will live for God. The, so the preacher wants to help people understand the Bible. He wants people to understand the Word of God. Uh, this is what blows me away. I've had I've had preacher voice, um, a preacher now that makes more money than maybe I'll ever make, makes a good amount of money, look me in the eye and tell me he just didn't want to study the Bible. He didn't really like studying, but now he makes thirty or forty thousand dollars a year as a preacher somewhere. I mean, does that not blow you away? A preacher that sits here and tells you, I don't really want to study the Bible, but if you put on a suit and you're willing to shut up and just follow the flow of things, and you have a good resume, you can find you a church somewhere that'll put you to work. You look the part. You agree with the main pastor. You just believe whatever they tell you to believe. Don't say what they tell you not to say. They'll pay you a bunch of money. There you go. That's what's going on right now in Christianity across the country. That ain't isolated. That's common. And I've seen more than one uh, person that I went to Bible college with or, or otherwise who have compromised in some way their views just to go halfway across the country and get a church, and then they become lukewarm watered down in most aspects, and they have their little pet thing they might talk about. Like I know one guy, he just talks about Pilgrim's Progress every single week, some book John Bunyan wrote. But, I mean, other than that little pet thing, everything else is just watered down. Everything else is just like, you know, general. They don't, they don't teach the whole Bible. Preachers are phony. They're not like the heart of Paul that wants to teach you the whole Bible. You know, everything, uh, the hard stuff against homos to the great stuff about heaven to eschatology, back to Christology, soteriology, all the ologies, you know. They want to teach you everything, strengthening people of God. And the effect of that preaching, it says, in verse 10, back in Colossians 1, the effect of this preaching that will, you know, why, oh, I just want to preach, I just want to teach people, I want people to understand the Bible. That's the heart of a preacher, right? Well, the effect of that is the reason that's the heart of the preacher. It's not just I want to fill people or Paul wants to fill people or any other uh, good preacher or man of God. It ain't like they just want to teach you the Bible. So, you know, everyone wondered why we learn the Bible? You ever wondered that? I'm sure Michael's wondered that. Kids have all kinds of questions. Why am I learning the Bible? Why learn it? Why go through Colossians? Why go through Daniel? Why go through Revelation? Why go through 1 Thessalonians like we have here? Why go through these books? But what's the point? Is it just to learn stuff? No, it gets to the effect. The effect of the preaching, the effect of the learning of the Bible is, verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You don't know how to walk if you don't know the word. Uh, you ever heard somebody say, uh, so-and-so is living right? That's a real common thing in our area. You know, oh, you're, you know, I remember when I, First start going to church, you know, back to town, I heard people tell me, oh, you're living right now. Uh, living right, living right. Well, this is what they mean right here, that you're walking, that you're living correctly. That's what it means here when it says that you might walk worthy of the Lord. It's basically saying that you're walking or you're living right. We know what it is to, you know, we know what's correct by the word. Now, think of it this way. If you don't know the word, how do you know what's right? This is what blows me away sometimes when people just act like they know everything. I know that's right, or I know there ain't nothing wrong with this. Well, actually, if you knew the whole Bible, you realize there was something wrong with it. And it's ignorance of the Bible that leads you to not know how to live. How do you know how to live for God if you don't know what God says? That, that's one of the main drivers I've had through reading the Bible. Why did I read through the Bible? Uh, as I have multiple times, really. Uh, get to the New Testament dozens of times. Why have I read so much of the Bible? Why do you read so much? I know Ashley reads the Bible a lot. I don't know how much you guys read. I don't, I don't live with you guys. But, you know, when you read the Bible, why do you do it? Why, why are you reading the Bible? It's so you, you know how to apply the Bible. If you don't read the Bible, you can't apply it. If you don't know it, you can't apply it. And so many people claim, well, I just know this. God's okay with this. Oh, really? Do you just know that God's okay with it? Because there's a lot of Christians that think God's totally okay with homo marriage, with gay marriage, as they call it. Now, that ain't nowhere near acceptable in the Bible. Now, what on earth would lead somebody to think that gay marriage was okay or gay marriage was normal? Total ignorance of the Bible. This is the true God of the universe. The one true God gave us his word. This is what he says. This is what he tells us is true. And if you know what's contained in this, you know what God says. 
And this is another reason. Sometimes I, I don't have um, a, a fear that someone else might have. I remember when I come out of Calvinism, and I studied it super hard, and I was like, man, I'm wrong on this, and this is wrong, and all this kind of stuff. I know I started saying stuff, and some people around me or something would be like, well, you need to be careful how you're saying that. Now, why would someone say you need to be careful of you know, condemning Calvinism or condemning this point here? It's because they might not know what I knew. And it's the same reason why somebody would be like, why are you being mean to the Jehovah's Witness? They don't know what I know. I know Second John. It says, don't even bid on God's speed. Don't even say God bless to somebody leading somebody to hell. Why didn't you let the, uh, the Mormons in your house? Why would you run them off and tell them never to come back? They don't, you don't know Second John, do you? You see, knowledge of the word leads to correct living out of the word. And a lot of people have no idea what the Bible teaches on something. And when you lack knowledge of what the Bible teaches, you lack conviction that leads to a life that applies that. And there's a lot of people who aren't applying the Bible, and this is why. They don't know it. I actually believe a lot higher. I mean, I have a, I have a lot more faith in Christians. A lot of people, you know, it ain't that a lot of Christians are just real bad people. I think a lot of Christians are just really ignorant. No one's ever told them the truth. No one, these Christians, they, if they knew what the Bible really said about stuff and had it clearly taught to them by a good preacher, they would say, whoa, I've been saying that gays are born that way. Romans 1 says gays become gay by, by the wrath of God. Wow, I never understood that. I read Romans 1 today. The preacher, I followed along with the preacher, and I understand that now. You know, simple teachings like that. Oh, people can become reprobate? Oh, wow. Uh, Jesus is going to reign and rule on earth for a thousand years? I never understood that. My preacher always told me that there is no millennium, that we're in it now. You know, those things, how do you get those things? When someone teaches you it or when you're reading through the Bible yourself, and I, have, I actually believe that a true Christian, if they actually are reading, getting that Bible, they're going to change their mind. They're going to say, you know what? I believe that now. The problem is a lot of preachers aren't doing that. Why? Because you have a lot of preachers like I run into. I don't like studying the Bible. So if you don't have a preacher who don't want to study the Bible, who don't want to learn the Bible, how's he going to teach the Bible? You can't teach what you don't know. And you can't live out what you don't know. And that's the point of this is the same reason Paul or me or anybody else wants to teach people is so they can live it out. It's the effect of the preaching. If your theology doesn't leave you, lead you to holiness, then your theology is wrong. If your theology and uh, understanding of God leads you to live an uncaring life that you never witness to nobody, there's something wrong with your theology. So in other words, you know, proper theology leads to proper action. I'll cover this last verse here, and I'll close here. Verse 11 says, Strengthened with all might, according to his uh, glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. So the strengthening here is not a physical one. It's not talking about you know, lifting weights or something. And this is what a lot of people don't understand. Um, and this is why I, I changed my mind in a lot of ways. When I used to start preaching back in 2012 to when I do now or something, I, I come to understand over time, and I even talked about this with other preachers, and I agree with them. Preaching is a spiritual exercise. Pre preaching and teaching, when you're sitting in a pew and someone in front of you re reading the Bible and applying the Bible and we're praying to God and we're doing all this in the Spirit, it's a spiritual exercise. It's not a physical one. And, you know, even Bible study, when you're reading the Bible at home, that's not a normal, it's not like you're reading, you know, uh, what's a normal, I don't read normal books, what, Harry Potter, you know, um, it's not like you're reading Harry Potter. Or it's not like you're reading some other uh, worldly book that some man wrote. When you're reading the Bible, it's a different thing. And I think a lot of times we think of these things carnally. We see them uh, with, you know, in a worldly way. Like, oh, I'm going to read this book here. Well, that's the Bible. It's different. The Bible is different. It's not just like any other book. It, the Bible is, is actually the only book ever written by God. And so when you read it, it's different. It transforms you. It, it changes you. And, and preaching's different like that, too. This ain't just like a lecture you get at college. That I mean, I know some preachers, and maybe even me, sometimes it might sound like a lecture, but it's not. It's a spiritual exercise, one in which God will join the preacher and empower him and lead him to say and, and do things that help the people. That's, what it, that's what naturally the way that it is. <clears throat> you can't see spiritual transformation. It, but it's a lot like John 3, if you think of it this way. 
In John 3, Jesus said that it's like the wind, right? When you talk about someone being born again, that you, you, you can't make it happen yourself. It's an act of God, right? God brings somebody to spiritual life. That's what, that's what happens. Now, that's after you believe in Jesus. That's what the Bible says. But God brings somebody to spiritual life, and you can't see that inward change. When someone gets saved, you know, I've, I've, I've seen people pray to accept Jesus, and you can think back to when you got saved, where, wherever it was, whether it was in your room or on the side of a road or, you know, in a church or wherever it was you got saved. Maybe it was in your kitchen. I don't know where you got saved. Wherever you got saved, think about that. Now, did you see... A bolt of lightning strike you and like, you know, some little Casper-like spirit float into your body. We didn't see anything, but you know that there's a change. That's the difference. That's, that's what it is. And that's the same thing with preaching and teaching and reading the Bible. You can read the Bible at home, and you say, well, I read a whole book. I don't know what changed. Trust me, something changed. God, the Holy Spirit in you, takes that word, and he works it through your spirit and out in your life. And in preaching and teaching, when you're in church, the same thing happens. Somewhere in the sermon, somewhere in what I say, or somewhere in what other preacher says, or preacher Bingham, whoever you listen to on TV or whatever, uh, even Charles Stanley, who retired now, I guess, you know, when you listen to these preachers, they will say something. It might not be everything. You might not even like the whole sermon, but they'll say something in there that God wanted you to hear, and God will use that to tweak your understanding of something and to make you curious about something and to lead you into something. That's the way that it goes. That's the way that God does these things. It's a spiritual exercise. This isn't some, like, class you could take where it's like, you know, I'm hitting all the points. That's what some dead as a doornail preachers I've seen do. They write a paper, and they try to just nail every point, and they don't understand that preaching is a spiritual exercise. It's a, this is a spiritual transformation. And the results of that spiritual transformation are, number one, this is what he goes through here, by the way, Back in Colossians, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm working through, whether or not you realize it, I guess. Um, patience. You see that in verse 11? When he says, unto all. So his glorious power works these things in you. Unto all, patience. That is the, uh, able to accept or tolerate delays, problems, or suffering without being annoyed or anxious. So I guess you could say going through a trial without breaking down. Me and Dad was listening to a sermon. This guy brought up Job and talked about how Satan said, "All of the man will, you know, he can, he, he'll curse you. A man will give for his life. All a man will give for his life, right? You know, but for somebody who deals with sickness or cancer or some bad disease or you know some trial of life, and they don't break down, they don't curse God, they don't lose the faith. That is a patience, a long suffering, that is a blessing of God. You say, how can I have that? I don't feel like I'm very patient. I don't feel like I, you know, am calm and collected and content like I should be. Well, maybe you need to actually absorb more of the Word of God and let God work that in you. Because as you know the Bible, and it's not just, well, I read me two verses, you know, I'm done. I got my reading done. Are you actually communing with God? Do you actually absorb it? Are you thinking on it? Are you meditating on it? You know, listen, listen to a sermon alongside that. You know, there's a lot of good preachers out there. You could find a sermon on Listen, meditate on his word, the Bible says, day and night. This is not something where it says, I just got that done, now I'm going to go do my life. That is how you see real transformation. Endurance and perseverance, which kind of goes along with the first one. Um, and then joy. He says all these things are worked in you by God. Now, joy is something a lot of people misunderstand. And, um, you know, a lot of people just say joy is happiness. And it can be happiness if you look up... Uh, a definition of joy, it says great pleasure and happiness. But, it, you know, joy, when we talk about joy biblically, it's not to be under, misunderstood as just being happy all the time. And I've seen a lot of preachers like that. I, I used to work in the town, and there's a guy that come down there one day. We was all sitting there at the time clock out. And, you know, here I am. You know, everybody knows I'm a Christian and whatnot, so, you know, they try not to cuss around me as much or something. And here I am. I'm sitting here, you know, I'm sitting here at the time clock out with everybody. And here comes in this preacher guy, and the whole time he's just like, you know, he's one of these guys. The whole time he's smiling, God bless you, brother, you know, that kind of thing. The whole time just smiling his, his little head off like that. Do you think he does that all day and night? Do you know anybody who all day and night, God bless you, brother, you know, nobody does that. That's not real. Do you, think any, do you think if he did what I did, do you think if he threw garbage for eight hours, 
He's just be running around like it, you know what I mean? That's what a lot of these preachers are. They're just running around, big old grinning, you know, hey. And they got this spiritual language. That ain't realistic. And some people might say, well, he's joyful and you're not. You better believe I'm joyful. And there's a, there's a, a lot of people make fun of these memes. You ever, you know what a meme is? They got a picture of these uh, Baptist women, and they're all like in coats, and they're sitting there like this. And the meme will say, I got joy, joy, joy down in my heart. You know, <laughs> it's like it looks like a lot of unhappy women. But listen, the joy of the Bible, the, the spiritual joy is not tied to just I always got to be smiley. And I, there's nothing ever wrong. That's not what joy is all about. Joy is tied to salvation. Joy is actually tied to knowledge of the Lord. That joy is this, even though I might be down and depressed and have anxiety and have health problems and no money and this and that, and the world, you know, sucks. It's hard, right? Thank God I'm still going to heaven. That's joy. And that don't always manifest itself through fake, uh, you know, piety or whatever these people say. And, and actually, sometimes being a good Christian means you're mad. I heard someone say the other day that being angry is, is a wicked sin. The Bible actually commands you to be, be angry, okay? Ephesians 4.26, be ye angry and sin not. Ever heard of this, let not the sun go down upon your wrath? In other words, you don't carry it with you all the time. Get mad, get it out of your system in a righteous way, and then go on about it. This is one thing I've learned to do with teaching. You know, I don't just dwell on something. I, you, know, you notice how I don't, I'm not hitting on Calvinism every single sermon I do, but I do hit on it sometimes. But, you know, when you teach against a heresy or you're teaching against a false thing as a preacher, you get it all in your system, you get the teaching out there, and then you're done. But some people, day and night, their whole ministry is the King James Bible version issue. Their whole ministry is Calvinism uh, is heresy. Their whole ministry is, you know, X, Y, Z. Their whole creation ministry, Kent Hovind. You know, they're letting the sun go down on their anger. They hate this one bad system of theology, and their whole life gets consumed with it. Instead, your whole life should be consumed with the knowledge and glory of God, the Bible, the whole Bible. I want to teach the whole Bible, but they've got consumed with this one thing. They got angry, which is good. It's good to be mad. If you, if you think about the murder of infants and you don't get mad, there's something wrong with you, which is abortion. If you think about the evils of our country and you don't get mad, there's something wrong with you. But instead, Christian pastors today are saying, well, you, that guy's angry. He's got an angry spirit. You should be angry sometimes. Did you know Elijah got mad and killed a bunch of the uh, false prophets on Mount, Mount Carmel? Read it. He killed a bunch of them. He was mad. He didn't like them. You know, I mean, anger is a good thing. It, being wrathful towards something, that's a good thing. God has wrath. God gets angry, but he doesn't stay angry. And so you don't want to just, your disposition's always anger. And you don't want to be, well, my disposition's always, you know, smiley man. God bless you, you know. That's just fake. That's fake. You're not real. And there's a lot, you, trust me, I guarantee you can think of a preacher you've met that was like that. They ain't real. They think in their mind that's what they think they got to look like. And I, I've always refused those things. I had preachers tell me I needed to be fake. I refused to. I don't care. It may not gain a crowd. It may not gain a following. But I'm not going to be fake. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of people online that have been blessed from it god used you in different ways he used me online in a lot of different ways and i put these sermons online and people enjoy them and say that they're a blessing and there's been people come here and there in this church and it, wherever god leads that's where i'll go and the same thing should be your mentality your joy your your purpose uh for a christian life there's a purpose and a joy of a pastor and the purpose and the joy of a, of a christian they really should be similar and they're both tied to the knowledge of god that's why you say, why should I read my Bible? You can't, you can't do what God wants you to if you don't know what he says. You can't live a godly life if you don't know what he says. And so I, I'll, I'll kind of leave it there. There's more that I could say, but I'll, uh, I'll end on that point. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, I thank you for an opportunity to worship you there this morning. And again, I, I lift up the people who aren't here and uh, all the people in the churches around us. I know I don't agree with their doctrine and their they're not really anywhere I would ever tell somebody to go. But there's a lot of good Christian people that go to these churches. And I just pray, God, that as their churches are closed down and we're trying to battle the coronavirus and each person's having to make their own decisions and, and whether or not they should go out, I just pray that you would draw them to you and maybe even lead them to good doctrine in some of these bad churches. Help us as your people get through this season in, in a wicked nation, trying times, surely hard times to come. 
And um, as we acknowledge your wrath upon this nation and this world, we thank you for your mercy and your, your infinite blessings you've given us through Jesus Christ, your Son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.